Welcome back to Zephyr Travels. I'm Randy and in this video we are giving you the second half of Justin Humphrey's keynote speech at the Airstream International Rally in Rock Springs. If you haven't seen the first half we suggest you watch that now. There will be a link up above in the description and at the end of this video. But in this section he's talking more about Airstream and what's going on with Airstream this year you know based on the change in market demand on trailers and RVs total. So listen to that and we'll be right back at the end of this. Um, so Thor, I get this all the time like well you know Airstream ain't as good since Thor bought them and I'm like well that one, it's 42 years ago man. <laughs> I see it on Airstream Addicts. If you're in here, I'm calling you out. <laughs> that one always gets me. Um, Thor bought us in 1980, which is hard to believe that's 43 years ago. That makes me feel really old. Um, but, uh, you know, Thor is a, is a wonderful uh, parent company. They do not tell us to take stuff out of our product to make it cheaper. They don't tell us our product plan, what it needs to be. They don't come down and say, hey, you need to move this production line over there. They are hands off. The only thing that Thor is going to do is make sure we're SOX compliant. We're, they're going to audit us. Um, IT, security protocols, that's important. And then they provide legal support, um, whether it's um, kind of labor uh, in, um, support or external support through customers. So it's just a resource for us. I think if we stopped sending checks, they would show up. <laughs> that would be a problem. But luckily, we've been sending checks, so they're happy. Um, so, so Thor is a, a great parent company. So let me kind of walk you through. It's really more of a holding company. Um, but they were founded in 1980 with the purchase of Airstream. That's pretty cool. In fact, they were, they were headquartered in, at Airstream until like 2012. Um, and then after they bought Airstream, of course, they started buying other RV companies. So I always tell my peers, I'm like, we basically bought you. I mean, let's that's, that's, just call it like it is. Because we're not the biggest anymore, but I always like to give them a hard time. They now have 30,000 employees, when you add up all the RV companies, uh, spread across almost 400 facilities worldwide. Um, 16 billion in sales, they're now Fortune 5, well into the Fortune 500 company. And um, if you look at what, what their kind of core values are and what their mission statements are, basically their essence is under one sky. Their purpose is inspiring, empower people to go everywhere, stay anywhere. And uh, their values are community, adventurous, compassionate, and trustworthy. Um, if you look at the number of manufacturers they own just in, in North America, it's uh, not only Airstream, but they own Crossroads, Cruiser RV, Dutchman, Jayco, Keystone, Heartland, Highland RV. Um, but, you know, some big acquisitions here over the past couple years. Tiffin, they own Tiffin now. Tiffin's always, Bob Tiffin's part of the group now. He's a peer which is pretty cool. Uh, Thor Motor Coach, Integra. So they own a lot of brands. What's really cool and where Airstream uses it, they also own the largest manufacturer in Germany called Heimer. Heimer is kind of like the Thor of Europe. They've got about 40% market share. They've got several German companies over there. They've got a plant in Italy. And what we like to do is go over there and visit their factories. It's, they open up anything, their QC systems, their apprentice programs, their um, sales programs, we get to visit their dealers. Uh, it's unbelievable for, for us to go over to Germany and have those best practices. And you know, Germans can really, I mean, they, they build good things. I mean, their quality is really solid. So we kind of look to them as more of a benchmark than we do in the US. So last year, Brian and I, along with uh, his counterpart, Tim, we went to, and our supply chain uh, VP at the time, who's now our VP of the motorhome uh, division, we went and visited the Heimer factory. We visited a, a company called Burstner. They make like 10,000 B-bands a year. It's an incredible operation. We visited uh, the year before Eastman Biscoff, which is really high in motorhomes. Deadlifts, which is another one. So this year, I'm planning my trip. We're gonna go to an Italian company called Leica. You know, I, I said, I'll take this one. <laughs> it's in Florence. I know. Bad. And I mean, I have to go all the way over there, and, and it's it's rough. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, and then there's another one. There's a huge RV show in Dusseldorf, Germany. It is massive. Man, I wish I wish you all. If you go to YouTube, I'm sure you'll see videos of it. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. 
Um, but there's another uh, manufacturer they have called LMC, just an hour and a half from, uh, from Dusseldorf, which is great, because we get to go there and learn their manufacturing techniques. It was amazing. When Brian and I were at Bursner, they pulled out what they pay for chassis. They're pulling out all of their prints. Hey, what do you want? Do you want anything? I think they think we're just Americans, and Americans own them. So they're like, you want to see anything here? <laughs> it's great. And uh, they're just so nice. It was incredible. But it was, it's amazing how open they are. So when, when I talk about Thor as a parent company, they, they're not dictating to us at all. If we screwed up something, it's our fault. Pointed at the executive team at Airstream. If we changed a component that failed, if, or if we built something that wasn't right, that is an Airstream executive team's fault. We own it, and we're gonna try to make that right. But it's not, I, I hear um, often like, oh man, Thor's making all these decisions. They don't, they don't make those decisions. Um, I always call them Daddy Warbucks because they, they supply the money, um, you know, the factory we built all in was probably about $70 million. And um, the capital expenditure form for Thor, it better be on one page, because if it takes two pages, then you don't need the factory. And I love that thinking. It's very simple, but very direct, and uh, they're, a great, they're a great parent company. So I shared this last year, I think it's worth sharing again. Since COVID, um, we're really um, going to Congress and as an industry, and we're, we're reminding them how big the RV industry is. It's a $74 billion industry. And when you look at RV sales services, and then you add campgrounds, um, how many employees there are, wages, tax benefits. And by taking this approach, um, we've gotten some funding for national park campgrounds, for state campgrounds. We recognize there's a lack of campgrounds. You know, it's very difficult. So if we can kind of go to Congress where they have control over some of the most, um, you know, the, the most popular places, then maybe we can get the infrastructure change we need. There's been a lot of success on this, um, and it's 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 working. So those things take a while to improve those areas, but uh, but we're really excited about. It. So I want to talk a little bit about demographics, which I think it, we're kind of in a little speed bump here. If you look at the industry numbers that were down that I was telling you about, um, I think one thing that really drives the industry is, is uh, retail financing, which impacts some of those lower cost models because they're highly financed. You know, the interest rates are a lot higher than they were uh, recently. Historically, they're probably not as bad um, if you kind of go back to the 70s, but it, it definitely slows that down. So I think those things will impact kind of sales and the seasonality. But I, if you look at the overall driving demographics, it's super exciting. So let me, let me explain why on the, on the RV space. So if you look at the, at the COVID people who entered the market, um, the median age, now this is the industry, this isn't Airstream, but I look at these as future Airstreamers. The median age was 33 years old. How cool is that, right? So we've got millennials coming in, which is fantastic because there's a bunch of them. Um, and you know, their average income is $90,000. I was really impressed with that. I was like, wow, that's, that's a great average income. I look at that as a future Airstream. So um, if, if we can get them in the industry and they like it, then I think it's something that we hopefully will see them. Uh, their average spend on an RV during COVID was $73,000. So if you look at the industry, you can tell those prices were, were pretty high. And um, a lot of aftermarket studies on that. Um, they're also a lot more apt to do peer-to-peer -peer rentals. So you see some of these apps come up where if you're not using your RV, you can rent them out. This group is a lot more comfortable with that than maybe what some of the uh, customer bases that we've had. Well, I know I wouldn't. I don't know about you. <laughs> but I've seen movies on how people don't know how to use an RV. Use an RV. So I like to keep my RV to myself. But they're, they're willing to do it. We'll see how that, if five years from now, what that number looks like. But I thought that was pretty cool. They're a lot more open to that with this passive income, or at least to help pay, make the payment on these if they're not using it. They're really using that um, quite a bit. And then why did they buy? We were kind of curious, like, you know, during COVID things were shut down, but you know, what all, what was the driving? You know, they wanted to do more road trips, travel and comfort, they want to explore. Um, but you know, there was a lot of, like 17% of them said they could work remotely. Now they could work at home. As long as they have a Wi-Fi connection, they can really work anywhere. So there's a lot more remote work. So we're seeing this group come in and being able to work on the road and, uh, and really have a, 
that life balance that many of us have not experienced, but, um, but really cool. So um, I've mentioned this in my articles on the Blue Beret, but you know, RV industry is largely multi-line dealers. And they've been great over the years. But um, I give a lot of credit to Ted Davis who spoke the first night. Um, we had had a small couple mom and pops that were exclusive. Ted came in and really took it to the next level and said this brand can go further. Started in Portland, went to Seattle, Boise, Northern California. And at first we were like, man, this is a really good idea. This is great. It's all Airstream. Now it's our religion. It's absolutely changed the face of the company. Um, in addition to TED now, we've got folks out east that are doing it, in the central region that are doing it. And when we see an exclusive store, the sales is triple than a multi-line store, um, and the customer satisfaction is up. So we're having our cake and eating it too. Both are growing. That doesn't mean every exclusive store is perfect. We still have our challenges. But it, because all they do is service and sell Airstreams every day, you get a lot better at it. You know, RVs are very complex. You got plumbing, electrical, woodwork, chassis, paint, like you name it, there's a bunch of things. If your technician's having to work on an Airstream, you know, fifth wheel, a pop-up, a Class C, a Class A from about 10 different manufacturers, they're not in a position to win. It's already a difficult job. So if they just work on Airstreams, they just, it just organically, it just works better. So currently, today, we've got about when you add up motorhomes and travel trailers in North America, we're closing in on 80 dealerships. Some only handle travel trailers, some only handle motorhomes. I'd say uh, there's about 70 that handle both. Um, 29 of them are exclusive now. So that's a huge percentage of our dealer body sells nothing but Airstream. So that's, that's awesome. And we've got 14 more letter of intents to sign. Some are converting current. I was out in Colorado, I met some of you here. Um, and I was out at that rally too, but Windish just bought a brand new facility. They're going exclusive in Colorado. So that's a conversion of a current multi-line store to a single brand store. And then we've got others. Charlotte is a ground up Greenfield, brand new location in Charlotte, North Carolina, brand new location in Detroit, Michigan. These things are under underway right now. So it's kind of a mix bag between converting in a current multi-line or starting a new one. Yeah, I'll start off right away. This is uh, Airstream of Utah. Um, I, I went and visited them when I landed, but it's kind of an industrial facility. It's a repurposed facility. Um, and so they've got tons of service. It's easy in, easy out. You know, because we give large territories, you don't have to be on retail row, and our dealers, really, Ted figured this out. Others followed suit. You can go repurpose these buildings and really make it a destination. And it makes the investment a little better too because you're not paying for like retail row in a, in a town. So we have a lot of these facilities and they're huge facilities. Um, and I'll, I'll show a few of these. And then the Wyoming store, check this out. Now what's cool about the Wyoming store, he's gonna have a campground tied to this with about 150 sites. So he's talk about being a destination and really trying to supplement some income. All you do is sell Airstream, you're like, okay, well, how do I make it this different? What's my value add proposition to customers? So, hey, come and buy an Airstream, stay at our campsite, they can really control that experience. So hats off to Dennis and his team for doing that. These are kind of the newer ones. Some of these I shared last year, I'm not sharing all 29, I wish I could. But this uh, is in um, Arizona, in Phoenix, Chandler. They, they bought a Sam's Club and converted it to and what's cool about Sam's Club is when you sign that agreement, purchase agreement, you have to promise you're not going to sell to Amazon or anybody else because they don't want to compete with a warehouse. So you can actually get a good deal on it, but at the same time, it's a temperature controlled environment in Phoenix, Arizona. When I went and visited them in the summer, it was 120 degrees. I was running for this building because it was so hot. So now you can have a great experience, all temperature controlled in Phoenix, Arizona. Not too shabby. This is a greenfield in Indianapolis. Uh, Woodland up in Grand Rapids was bought out, uh, it was acquired by somebody actually outside the industry. They converted it to an exclusive store in Grand Rapids. Um, overnight, became a top five dealer. A dealer that had been around for 50 years, had never hit the top 10. The moment they went exclusive, became a top five dealer um, in the East. That's pretty amazing and it shows the power. They love the model. And they said, hey, how about Indianapolis? So they built this, we had, did a grand opening this past year. 
Um, and then they're also building, I didn't have the photos, they're building a brand new ground up facility in Detroit, top 10 RV market in the entire nation. So we're really, really excited about that. Uh, Airstream of Austin, some of those in Texas, I might have seen you at the big grand opening. Yes, Austin, Texas, they just converted to an exclusive. Um, they're uh, currently also doing a new RV store, so it's still a little bit kind of shared property, but really excited about this once they get that RV store opened up. Um, I'm really excited about the Austin market, that'll be huge. Charlotte, I told you about the Charlotte location coming, these are renderings. They actually kind of, uh, they're taking the, they weren't really wanted to look like the Airstream factory. Um, all of the units will be in a park setting plugged in, so you can kind of get a feel for what it's like. There's going to be a whole bunch. I'm telling you, you get one exclusive store, do something amazing, and it's, it's the old capitalistic set. Well, I can do better than that, so I'm going to do a park setting. And I'm like, yeah, you, yeah, you do that. What are you going to do now? You got the park setting. We have fun with that. But I, I mean, this is really exciting. The level of investment for these exclusive stores is amazing. This is Minnesota. So it used to be Shorewood, bought out by Lazy Days. They're moving a little further north. 50,000 square foot facility, temperature controlled, and north of Minneapolis. Kind of an important thing in Minnesota to be indoors. Um, everything can be indoors now. This is, I'm probably letting the cat out of the bag because Lazy Days really wants to promote this uh, this fall, but it's coming this fall. They're, they're, they're moving. Right now they're updating the, uh, the building. So super excited about it. We have other LOIs um, out there. Letterman Tents, um, Reno. That'll be another uh, Airstream Adventure store. Yep. Uh, they're looking for facilities now, but you know, hopefully in the next 12 months we'll have more there. Um, Miami. Yeah, any Miami fans? <laughs> Sounds like we need more Miami dealer. I don't have anybody in Miami here. So we have, we've got Miami uh, on board. Uh, Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg is going to Boston. So we'll have an exclusive store in Boston uh, with some Dunkin's. I think he's gonna have some Dunkin' Donuts there on site. Um, and, we, and we've got others coming. So we've got exclusive stores coming all over. So we're really excited about the, the investment. If you look at the investment at, the, uh, at Airstream, I, I mentioned it's around $70 million. We added it up with our dealer partners. There's almost $400 million in investments in exclusive stores out in the country. So when I talk about it, these guys are, are making this investment not to just take care of customers. I know we gotta take care of customers better, and we're really working on that, but it's a huge, they're putting their money where their mouth is. And I think it's the, I will go on record to say it is the largest dealer investment on a single brand in the history of the RV business, period. And I think that's a good thing, because it's your brand. So, um, yeah, this is what it's really all about. And our job is to make sure it's as convenient for you as possible. Um, I can tell you, we are really focusing on service capacity. Uh, last year at the dealer meeting, I told our dealers, one of our requirements for programs moving forward is that they meet certain service capacity requirements. So we're laying that out today. We've actually can go into each one of their territories and know how many Airstreams are renewing their registrations every year. They're renewing their registrations, they're using their Airstreams, they're using their Airstreams, they need service. So let's use that as a basis for service requirements. So that's coming out for our dealers. Um, really, as we head into our dealer meeting coming up in August, we're going to be laying out those requirements um, to meet certain standards. We recognize we need to support you on these adventures. We, we want this to really be a tool for you to enjoy your life, have a better quality of life, enjoy your, your spouse and, and your family and your friends. And um, it's just so cool to, to come out here and see each of you doing that this week. So um, with that, I got to tell you, there's 1,400 hardworking families, as Mona pointed out. They each represent a family. They're back in Jackson Center. They're texting me, how's the rally? Is everybody cool? How, you know, what's going on? How's Wyoming? Um, they all send their regards. So they want to thank you for your business, as I, as I do. And um, love to see you in the display. We'll be here to answer questions. All these people that we introduce, if you have a question, concern, got service people here, sales people here, we're here to help you. And uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your business. And uh, we appreciate everything you do. And thanks again to the club for having us. So, thank you. Now we've got about $2,000 worth of gift certificates to give out. I know that's why you're here. 
be submitted. And uh, we got 15 $100 gift cards. And then we've got four $250 gift cards. You gotta be present to win. So uh, let's roll. Richard Collins and Cynthia Collins. Oh. On a roll. Well, I hope you enjoyed Justin's uh, discussion, his keynote speech. I hope you've seen both parts of it. Obviously, if you haven't, I've told you where all the links are. Um, and if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Hit that bell for notifications. Oh, and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. That's how all that works. And give us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. We always like to listen, hear your comments and respond back to you and talk to you. So do that. And until the next time, we will see you guys down the road. Take care.